In this video, I'll cover some information I didn't mention in the previous videos of this section, and then I'll introduce you to the concepts of margin and short selling. Finally, I'll discuss how you trade shares of international stocks. All right, let's start off with some definitions. So you've probably heard of a bull market. A bull market is a market where prices are rising and investors are relatively optimistic about future growth opportunities. In other words, investor sentiment is high. The period from 2011 to 2019 was generally considered a bull market. A bear market is the exact opposite. This is a market where asset prices are falling or investors are pessimistic about growth in the value of assets. So we would say that depressions are typically bear markets, for example. That's the extreme case. There are two other definitions I need you to know before we get too deep into this video. The first is what a long purchase is. Now, there's two sides to every trade. You have the buyer of a security and the seller of a security. The buyer or the per is the person who takes the long position. They're essentially buying it because they believe that security will appreciate in value. You can also have a short position, and that individual is the person that believes that the security will decline in value. Now, a long purchase is a purchase where someone just outright buys an asset. So if you buy shares of a stock, you made a long purchase. You want to buy low and sell high. The opposite of that is a short sale. And a short sale occurs when someone believes that the value of an asset will decline in the future. So the goal here is to sell an asset that you don't own and buy it back at a lower price. In other words, you, you're taking the short position and you want to sell high and buy low. Now, that seems like a funky concept, I'm sure, if you've never heard of a short sale, but I promise you we'll talk about it in a few minutes in much greater detail, so don't worry about it. Just know that a long purchase is generally most purchases on the market if you want to buy shares and short sales are bets that the share price of a security will decline in the future. Now, regardless of whether we're talking about a long or short position, we always need to know the hours when stocks are trading. The regular trading session for U.S. exchanges is 9.30 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. However, most exchanges and alternative trading systems offer extended hours. For example, the NASDAQ pre-market period is from 4 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. And after-hours trading occurs from 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. The problem with pre-market and after-hours trading is that in order for your trade to be processed, your order needs to be a limit order, and it has to directly match another outstanding limit order. We call a market like this a crossing market. Pre-market and after-hours trading see relatively low trading volume when compared with regular trading hours. These markets, the pre-market and the after-hours market, are far less liquid than the market is during regular trading hours. All right, now let's talk about buying on margin. Margin is a callable loan provided by a broker. You can borrow up to a certain limit in order to buy more securities. You pay your broker an interest rate plus a service fee. The interest rate your broker charges is relatively low. The loan is secured by the assets in your brokerage account. When we're going forward, I'll refer to margin as the percentage of capital contributed by you. In other words, it's your own personal equity in your brokerage account. It's what you have left once you pay your broker back. The initial minimum amount of margin you can have in your brokerage account is set by the Federal Reserve at 50%. In other words, half of the value of your brokerage account has to be money you contributed and the other half is going to be debt that you owe to your broker. However, over time, your minimum margin also known as your maintenance margin, can be lowered to 40% or 30%. If the amount of margin you have in your account falls below the maintenance margin, you'll suffer what's called a margin call. This means that your broker will require you to add more cash to your account to increase your margin above the maintenance margin, or they're going to sell the assets in your portfolio for you in order to repay your loan to them and increase your margin. All right, now this is the formula we use to calculate margin. You can use it to solve almost any problem related to margin. 
So like I said, margin is essentially the percentage of your brokerage account that is comprised of your own equity. In other words, how much is what you really own versus how much you owe your broker. We can break that down into this part right here. So the value of your portfolio or the market value of your portfolio is going to be made up by a number of shares of stock times the price of each share of stock. You're going to borrow a certain amount from your broker. So to calculate the equity in your portfolio, all you're going to do is just take the market value of your portfolio and subtract out the amount you owe to your broker. And that's going to give you your margin. So let's take a look at an example. If the market value of my account is currently $10,000, a maintenance margin of 60% means that $6,000 has to be my own capital, and at most, I can borrow $4,000 from the broker. Or in this example, at most, $4,000 could have been borrowed from the broker. Now, if the value of your portfolio falls below $10,000 and you've borrowed $4,000 from your broker, what that means is that your margin the amount of your own equity in this portfolio will fall below the maintenance margin of 60%. And when that happens, you really have two choices. You're going to have to add more capital or cash to your account, so essentially put more money in your brokerage account, or you're going to have to close your existing positions. So you're going to have to liquidate your shares of, let's say, Apple stock, and then repay your broker. Now, there's one big reason why you'd want to buy on margin. You want a higher return. You benefit because margin allows you to magnify your return. Buying on margin amplifies your return because you only owe what you borrowed from your broker plus some interest, while any capital gains in your portfolio, net of that borrowing, are yours. The big disadvantage of buying on margin is that you're increasing the amount that you can lose, both because you owe what you borrow to your broker and also because you're paying the interest rate on the loan from your broker. Uh, typically, that interest rate is going to be 1% to 3% above the prime rate, which is a few basis points or maybe a percentage point above the Fed funds rate. So you might be paying 5% for example, to your broker to receive a margin loan. All right, let's take a look at buying on margin in this example. So you have $1,000 in a trading account, a brokerage account. You want to buy as much as you can of Apple stock, which trades at $100. Your maintenance margin is 50%. How many shares can you buy on margin? Let's start by determining the amount you would have in your brokerage account. So here's the formula I already gave you. And if your maintenance margin is 50%, that means that half of the value of your portfolio is equal to the value you have in your account. So we'll just substitute 0.5 for your margin, and we know that you have $1,000 in your account. So here we're just going to solve for the denominator, so just the total assets or the total market value of your portfolio. And here we find that your total assets or the total value of your portfolio is $2,000. If you have $1,000 in your own equity, and this would mean that you would have $1,000 that you borrowed from your broker, that would give you your margin of 50% or your maintenance margin. Next, we can substitute the, this information into our equation and solve for the number of shares owned. So here we just plug in the maintenance margin on the left-hand side. We know the price of Apple stock is $100 per share. We know that you borrowed $1,000 from this previous part since equity plus debt is equal to total assets. And we just solve for the number of shares owned. In this case, you own 20 shares. All right, let's keep going with this example. If the price of Apple stock from the previous question falls to $90 after you buy the stock, how much will you have to add to your account? Now remember, your margin in your account always has to be greater than or equal to your maintenance margin, which means in this example, it has to be greater than or equal to 50% or 0.5. So right now, if the price of Apple stock falls from $100 to $90, when we solve for the, main, solve for the margin in your account, what we're getting is 0.4444, or just four repeating. So we need to get this back to 50%. So 
So the question is, how much do we need to add to get our margin back to the maintenance margin of 0.5? Well, the answer is, well, all we have to do is just create a new variable. We'll call it cash added in the numerator. So this is the cash that you're going to add to your brokerage account, and we're going to solve for it. So we're just going to take this 990 times 20, so 1800 over to the other side. Uh, that would give us 900 over here. And then we'd have 1800 minus 1000, so that's 800 over here. Uh, and then we'll take that 800 over to the left hand side, subtract it from the 900, and we get cash added of $100. So, in order in this problem for us to get from our margin of 0.4 repeating, all the way back up to our maintenance margin of 0.5, we need to add $100 to our brokerage account. All right, let's try another example. So you just purchased 100 shares of Tesla for $200 each, and your initial margin is 50%. The maintenance margin is 30%. How far can the price of Tesla shares fall before you receive a margin call? So first off, let's, let's just assume that our margin call occurs at 30%. There are two steps here. First, we need to determine exactly how much cash and debt we've used. So our cash is just the amount that we put into our brokerage account, and then we'll be able to determine how much debt or how much we've borrowed from our broker uh, based on this information. So we've already purchased 100 shares for $200 each, and our current margin is 50%. And then we're going to solve for the price per share in this form uh, using the formula I just showed you. So in this case, our total assets are just the 100 shares of Tesla that we own for $200 each. Uh, so that's just $20,000. Our initial margin is 50%. And so based on that, we can determine the equity in our portfolio. Uh, all we're going to do is just take this 20000 over to the left-hand side and our equity is $10,000. Our debt is just $20,000 minus our equity. So total assets minus equity is equal to debt. Next, we're going to need to solve for the price per share in the formula. In this case, we're going to bust out our margin formula. So we know that the price of Tesla's shares is $200 each. We know the number of shares. We know that we borrowed $10,000. Let's see how far these shares can fall in price before we suffer a margin call based on the maintenance margin. In this case, all we're doing is just plugging in all of the information we have and then solving for price. So again, we have 100 shares of Tesla stock, $10,000 worth of borrowings from our broker, maintenance margin of 30%. And once we solve for this, we'll find that the price that Tesla shares can fall to before we suffer a main, uh, margin call is $142.86. Like I said earlier, this formula right here can be used to solve just about any margin formula or any margin problem you would ever come across. All right, let's take a look at how you calculate the return on your margin account. Now, this is a little different from the return or the holding period return formulas, uh, mostly because you're including interest paid on the margin loan. Uh, you do also have any income you received, so from dividends, for example. And then uh, the denominator here is not actually going to be the total value of your portfolio when you first invest. Rather, it's going to be the amount of equity that you used uh, that you contributed to your account uh, prior to purchase of securities. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the market value of securities when you sell them minus the market value of the securities when you bought them on margin, add in any dividend or other income you received, and subtract out any interest paid on that margin loan to your broker. So for example, let's say that you had $2,500 in your brokerage account. You also borrowed another $2,500 from your broker. That means that you, once you borrowed that money from your broker, you had $5,000 to invest in the market. You invested it, and over the course of a year, 
that $5,000 worth of securities that you purchased appreciated to $7,500. You also probably received $100 in dividends, but you also have an interest expense to your broker. You paid interest to your broker on the margin uh, loan of $125. We can plug all that information in, and what we will find is that your return on your brokerage account when the value of your portfolio appreciates by only 50% is going to be about 99%. So notice here that from the start to the finish of the investment period, the value of your portfolio went from 5,000 to 7,500. That's a 50% appreciation. But because you bought on margin, in other words, you borrowed money from your broker and levered up, as we say, your return increased tremendously from 50% that it would have been all the way up to 99%. So this is the value of buying on margin. If you strongly believe that there's going to be a large appreciation in the value of some asset, it makes sense to buy on margin. All right, now that you're familiar with margin trading, let's talk about short sales. A short sale is a trade where you where you believe that the share price of an asset will fall over time. Your profit is equal to the market value of the stock at the beginning of the trade, minus the value of the stock when you close out the short trade, minus any dividends, and then also interest that you're paying to your broker to be able to short uh, shares that they own. Now, most short trades are for a period of a few months at most. You short a security when you believe it's overvalued. So let's take a look at how this happens in graphical form. So there's essentially two periods to a short trade or essentially two actions to a short trade. Let's say that you believe that Tesla is horribly overvalued. It's priced at $1,000. You believe it's probably worth closer to 200 and you want to profit from that information. So first thing you're going to do is you are going to borrow shares of Tesla from your broker and sell them on the open market for cash. And this is a lot simpler than I'm making it sound. You're literally just going to enter that information to your ECN, your brokerage platform, and that's gonna tell your, your broker you wanna borrow their shares of Tesla. If they don't own shares of Tesla, they might have a client that does, whose shares they're holding in what's called street name. So they're gonna let you borrow those shares. So that's step one, borrow shares from your broker, immediately sell those shares for cash on the open market. What you do with that cash is more or less up to you. You can invest it in some other security if you want to, but you still owe your broker a certain number of shares of Tesla. Now, you need to close out that short position eventually. Usually that'll be within a, a couple months. Now, to close out a short position, what you're going to do is buy the same number of shares of Tesla on the open market that you shorted. And you're going to return those shares that you buy on, let's say, day two, to your broker. And if your broker borrowed those shares from another one of their clients, they're gonna return those shares to their client. That's essentially it. Your goal here is to sell high on day one and buy low on day two. And that's how you make a profit on a short trade. So. We have two formulas when we talk about shorting. We have the formula for shorting profit. Like I said, your value that you sell your shares or market value that you sold your shares for on day one. And then you're gonna subtract that from that the value that you had to buy those shares back for plus any dividends, plus any interest that you paid to your broker because technically you're, you're shorting on margin. So you're essentially, you owe your broker some interest on that short trade. Now, to calculate the return on your shorting activity, all we're gonna do is just divide your profit by the margin requirement, which is just the initial sale price, so the price that you sold those shares for, so market value zero right here, times the required margin, which would probably be something like 50%. All right, let's take a look at an example. You believe that the price of Ford stock, which is currently $10 a share, will fall, and you want to profit from that decline by shorting 500 sh shares of Ford stock for a year. 
Your your required margin percentage is 75%, and your broker charges 5% interest to borrowers. Ford also paid a $0.25 cent dividend during the period. If Ford's share price falls to $8 a share by the end of the period, and you close out your short position, what are your total profit and return on this investment? So our initial market value of the shares that we're shorting is are just the share price of $10 times the number of shares outstanding. So 500 times 10, that gives us $5,000 is MV0. Next, when we close out the short trade, in other words, a year from now when we buy those shares back, those shares are now worth $8, and we're buying back 500 shares. So 500 times 8, 4,000 uh, is market value at time period 1. Next, we owe our broker any dividends that the shares earned, and these shares, all 500 of them, paid a $0.25 cent dividend. So we owe our broker 500 times the $0.25 cent dividend of $125. Next, our margin requirement is the market value that we calculated earlier. In other words, the, the value that we sold our shares for times the required margin percent. And in that case, it was 75%. So in other words, our required margin was 3750 And our interest on our margin is just that 3750 times the interest rate of 5%. So 3750 times 5%. We owe our broker $187.50. So our shorting profit is just the combination of all of this. Uh, so $5,000 minus the, the quantity of your $4,000 plus $125 plus $187.50. Our profit on this trade was $687.50. Our return is just that $687.50 divided by our margin requirement, which was this 3750. In other words, our return was 68750 divided by 3750, which gives us about 18.33%. So our return on this short trade was it was it was pretty sizable. We made a lot of money on this trade. So good job to us. Now let's move on to our final topic for the section, international markets. I spent a lot of time describing the U.S. market, but there are a lot of other large markets where securities are traded. The largest financial centers outside the U.S. are London, Tokyo, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. Each of these cities has at least one large stock exchange. London has the London Stock Exchange, and Tokyo has the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Most of the largest exchanges operate in a manner similar to that of the NASDAQ, with electronic trades comprising the majority of trading volume. Holding international securities is important for international investors primarily for the diversification benefit. International stocks are more exposed to markets that U.S. equities might not be exposed to. International stocks might also be de denominated in different currencies, which, if they appreciate relative to the U.S. US dollar during your holding period could be beneficial to you. Also, you might be able to find some significantly undervalued securities in international markets. So the question we should ask is, how do you purchase international securities? Well, there's several ways to do this. The safest method to increase your exposure to international markets is to buy shares from a multinational firm like Coca-Cola or Apple. These firms operate in over 100 countries and are exposed to market factors in each to a varying degree. For example, Coca-Cola might benefit from an increase in demand for soft drinks in South Africa, which increases firm profit and leads the firm to increase its dividend. Another way to invest internationally is to simply buy shares of stocks that trade on foreign stock exchanges. For example, if you identified a firm in Botswana, which is in Sub-Saharan Africa, whose shares are undervalued, you might be able to buy shares directly on the Botswana Stock Exchange. Different exchanges have different rules, and often which broker you will uh, you have will determine which exchanges you can buy and sell securities in. Another method is to buy shares of international firms that trade solely on U.S. exchanges. Some firms from developing countries might not have a stock exchange in their home country and therefore could decide to list on the NYSE or the NASDAQ. 
These firms are often the largest stocks in their respective markets. And listing their shares on the NYSE and the NASDAQ is a great way to signal international investors that the firm is of quality. Because the NYSE and NASDAQ, they have a lot of reporting requirements that international stock exchanges don't have. So listing on the NYSE and the NASDAQ is more difficult than you might think, and it's only the best of the international securities that would list on the NYSE or the NASDAQ. Finally, you could buy American depository shares. ADSs are shares that trade on U.S. stock exchanges, but are backed by shares of stock in another market. U.S. banks will buy up those shares that are trading on an international exchange and hold those shares in their vault and issue shares on the NYSE or the NASDAQ that are backed by a certain number of foreign shares. Uh, sometimes we, we refer to these shares or what's backing them up as ADRs. These ADRs and the, the accompanying ADSs allow U.S. investors to buy and sell shares of international firms like Alibaba or Heineken. Now let's talk about the risks associated with foreign securities. So as you might expect, investing in foreign securities is often more risky than investing in U.S. securities. This is because the same risks like credit risk, interest rate risk, or business risk all apply. But international stocks can also face large amounts of political risk and exchange risk. Political risk refers to the risk associated with changes in legislation, regulation, or the rule of law in a country. Political risk in the U.S. is fairly low since it's governed by a common law legal regime and has favorable shareholder rights and it's historically assumed that the, the rule of law holds in the country. In other words, everyone should be held equal under the law. In countries like China or Iran or Venezuela or Saudi Arabia, that's not the case. In these countries, individuals and businesses can have their assets seized without warning or due process. A common political risk event in these developing world countries is called nationalization, when the government announces it's just taking over the assets of some business or some group of people. This happened in the 1950s in Iran, when the assets of what later became British Petroleum were seized by the Mossadegh regime. Venezuela nationalized its oil industry in 1976, taking control of wells and refineries. I mean, there are many of these nationalization events across the third world and the developing world through history. A lot of them in South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and also uh, some, some countries in uh, Asia. The last risk I want to mention is exchange risk or exchange rate risk. This is the risk caused by the varying exchange rates between two currencies of two different countries. As you can imagine, if you buy a stock denominated in euros and then sell it six months later, the exchange rate between the euro and the dollar will likely have changed. We need to factor this change in exchange rates into our return formula. So let's take a look at an example of this just briefly. So you buy 100 shares of Carrefour, which is a French supermarket chain, for 15 euros per share on January 1st. The exchange rate on January 1st is 1.1 euros per US dollar. In other words, each euro buys 1.1 US dollars. You paid, obviously you're buying 100 shares times 15 euros each times 1.1 dollars per each euro. So the price you pay for these shares is $1,650. However, let's say that you want to sell those shares on July 1st. Uh, right now, on July 1st, those shares are worth 20 euros per share. So you would sell them. However, the exchange rate on July 1st has now fallen from 1.1 euros per dollar to 0.8 euros per dollar. This means that when you convert your shares that are denominated in euros back into US dollars, you're gonna have your 100 shares times the 20 euros per share that they're trading at, but now each euro buys fewer dollars. So we're multiplying by 0.8 here, and although the value of each share appreciated in their own currency from 15 to 20, the value of euros relative to the dollar has fallen, and this means that the value of your total investment depreciated from 1650 
all the way down to 1600 This means that your return was, well, it's the price at the end minus the price at the beginning, all divided by the price at the beginning. Your return was actually negative, a negative 3.03%. So although Careforce shares appreciated, uh, the depreciation in the value of the euro actually harmed your portfolio. So th the lesson here is that exchange rate risk can be a huge risk and actually lead to a decline in the value of your securities. So always be mindful when you're investing in securities that are denominated in another currency. Uh, generally, the exchange rate fluctuations won't be as large as this over a short period of time, but they do have that possibility. So always be mindful of that. All right, so let's recap. Buying on margin increases the risk and the potential return on investment to you. You should also know that shorting is one of the best ways that we have for allowing an investor to profit from the decline in the value of a stock. Uh, so if you want to decline, you want to profit from a decline or as a future decline in the value of Tesla, which was the security we gave in the example, you would want to short Tesla by borrowing it from your broker, selling it, and then buying it on the open market at a later date and returning those shares to your broker and closing out the trade. We also talked about international investments, and international investments expose an investor to both increased amounts of political and exchange rate risk. So that's all I have for you in this section, and let uh, we'll wrap up here, but if you do have any other questions, please feel free to uh, email me or call me or stop by my office hours. Uh, thank you very much.